Hello, Anime Advisor here. And where's Signum? Signum? You there? Strange. Is the rest of the CDR Holonov working? All right, so all that's working, but not Signum. I guess I'll do the fall 2017 anime review by myself then. I won't be covering every anime that aired, but I'll be covering a healthy amount, all of which had varying quality. This might take a while, so let's go ahead and start the fall 2017 anime review. Let's begin with an anime I originally previewed for the summer 2017 season. Welcome to the ballroom. A professional dancer named Sengoku rescues Tatara Fujita, an introverted third year middle school student who is being harassed by delinquents. Tatara ends up at Sengoku's dance studio where he meets Shizuku Hanaoka, a schoolmate he comes to secretly idolize. From this defining moment, when Tatara enters the world of dance, Sengoku is a free-spirited, dynamic international dancer who recognizes Tatara's potential and begins to coach him. Through dance, Tatara meets another schoolmate, a dance prodigy named Kiyoharu. Through these new friendships, Tatara develops a passionate desire to improve as a dancer and be accepted by his peers and rivals, which nurtures his own native talent. And through interaction with Tatara, other dance members are encouraged to take steps to overcome their own challenges and issues. Boiling down everything that makes up Welcome to the Ballroom and what it does for the most part, I would say that it is a decent sports anime. It hits a lot of similar notes that you'd find in any other competent sports related anime. Rivals, not giving up, struggling to overcome, are all themes that any decent sports anime will touch on. And that goes the same here in Welcome to the Ballroom. Where Welcome to the Barroom slightly differs is there's ever so slightly, and I mean ever so slightly, a hint of romance. It's there enough to get noticed, but is small enough to have no real bearing on the characters or plot. From a stylistic point of view, Welcome to the Barroom can look quite impressive, especially when it's portraying the psyche of its characters. However, I do think at times the giraffe necks of the character designs were a bit much. Also, one of the things I was looking forward to that I mentioned in the summer preview was I was hoping to see some nice choreography with the dance scenes. Unfortunately, for the most part, that didn't happen. The dancing in the openings are nice, and the dance in the final episode was well done, as well as a few other scenes here and there, but a good amount of the quote-unquote dancing is done through still images. Oh, sorry, I paused for Signum to retort, but they're obviously still not here. Anyway, there actually is an understandable reason why the animation doesn't stand up with other parts of the anime. The main reason is the main animator that was working on the dancing scenes got sick, so the younger animators had to take over. So an anime that had decent animation at times could have been just as good or better throughout. It's a shame that the things played out the way they did, but c'est la vie. Really, Welcome to the Barroom is an all-around decent anime. It's a solid sports drama that gives viewers who are interested a hint of romance. Overall liked the style, but was slightly turned off by the character's odd giraffe necks. While the situation with the main animator is unfortunate, Welcome to the Barroom can only be graded on what it presents, not what it could have been. It could have showcased some really great dance animation, but because it didn't and resorted to a slideshow presentation at times instead, I can only say it's an okay anime that had an opportunity to be really good. Up next, an anime I initially covered in the fall 2017 anime preview, Code Realize. Cardia has a deadly poison residing in her body, and as a result, gets called a monster by others. One night, she meets a mysterious man calling herself Arsene Lupin, who leads her to industrial London. From there, she meets various people covering the truths and real stories behind the strange people and land, in an attempt to recover her memories and search for her father who holds the keys to her memories in London. You know, for an anime that's based off an Otome visual novel, meaning it's targeted mostly towards women, Cold Realize isn't too bad. There's a decent amount of action and story outside the romance, and the romance itself, being a reverse harem, was also handled well. Now, that's not to say you should go out and watch this anime immediately. It's decent, not great. While there's a good amount of story, it doesn't feel like things are explained very well regarding some events and characters, and things just seem to happen, especially towards the end. I feel that's probably due to it being based on a visual novel that has multiple routes, where you learn certain things about a character or events in one route, 
that are already established when you play the next. Because Code Realize only adapts Lupin's route, some of the other characters feel a bit undefined, especially Saint Germain. I am still not 100% sure what he was doing or why. The animation isn't always up to snuff, and while it has some decent action, some of the episodes can be rather slow and a little boring. But it's not all bad. The character designs are some of my favorite from the season. That range from cool, cute, and handsome. There's also some nice facial expressions every once in a while that sort of ended up being one of the main reasons why I stuck with this anime when it started to slow down. It's never outright bad or offensive in any way, but it doesn't do enough to stand out. But I still kind of enjoyed this anime. I will say it's worth watching if you like reverse harems. Also, if you've never watched a reverse harem or otome anime, this one seems like it would be a good one to be someone's first. There's just enough story and action that prevents this anime from getting too lovey-dovey for potential newcomers to the genre. Moving on to another anime I previewed at the beginning of the fall 2017 anime season, King's Game. Nobu Aki Kanazawa, who transferred to a high school far away, is afraid of getting intimate with his new classmates because of the events that happened from his previous school. This led him to shut his heart. However, he starts to open up during the sports festival's class relay. He and all his classmates receive an email from the king. At first, his classmates didn't take what they were told seriously, thinking it's just a joke. But Nobuaki, the only one who knows the real meaning of it, fights against the death game that will soon begin. The rules of the King's Game are as follows. 1. All class members must participate. 2. The order sent by the King through email must be followed within 24 hours. 3. A punishment will be given to those who don't follow the order. 4. Quitting the King's Game halfway is forbidden. So how was King's Game? I'm not sure where to begin exactly, but I'll start by saying that King's Game is bad. It's not good. It's a complete nonsensical bloodbath. However, it's one of those anime that it's so bad, it's good. By that I mean it's a train wreck of an anime series, but I enjoyed what convoluted thing it would come up with next. An example, the reason given for why the King's Game is happening, if you're curious, it's because of a virus that infects both humans and computers. Yeah, that's the type of logic we're dealing with here. Another good example is how everyone in the classroom lets Natsuko constantly kill their classmates or themselves. Seriously, she's a high school girl. She shouldn't be that hard to overpower, especially if the whole class worked together. But that would require this anime making any kind of sense. King's Game specifically in the middle of the season is all over the place, as it constantly flashbacks to the previous King's Game Nobuaki was in. It too was filled with ridiculous character decisions. Though I admit, Rio was sort of a badass. She did not give a fuck about being set on fire. That's a lot of this anime thinking about it. It's all trying to be edgy. King's Game is just sex, death, and blood. Yeah, that's basically all this anime is. I don't know if I need to explain it any further than that. It's a bunch of dumb characters forced into an over-the-top situation that are then forced to either fuck or fuck each other over by killing them. If you're in the mood for something bad, but entertaining, check it out. If you want your anime to be a little more serious, then definitely pass on King's Game. Let's move on to another anime I previewed at the start of the fall season, and one that also had its fair share of nonsense, but was much more enjoyable. Anime Gateris. The anime centers on Minoa Asagaya, a new high school student at Sakaneko Private High School. Despite being a novice to anime, Minoa's classmate, Arisu Kami Igusa, invites her to make an anime research club at school. Through conversations with her classmate, Miko Koenji, as well as various anime-loving upperclassmen, Minoa gradually gets hooked on anime. While they stand against the student council's conscious efforts to disband their club, and they ignore the impending end of the world, they talk about anime, whether in Akiba or in real-life sacred place anime settings, or the hot springs. Anime Gatari starts off pretty tame. It feels like a slice-of-life comedy that revolves around the characters talking about anime, I enjoyed that because the anime they talked about were clearly parody names of actual anime. R-Zero is referenced a lot, The Girl Who Slept Through Time was one of my personal favorites, and Who Can Forget, Anosuba. That one in particular gets a little meta when Yui, who is voiced by Ria Takahashi, voices a character who is a parody of Megumin from Konosuba. Megumin who is of course voiced by Ria Takahashi. So she voices a character who voices a parody of the character she voices. Simple, right? 
There's also a few other fun references here and there for anyone who has seen enough anime is going to get immediately. It's definitely a show more geared to the quote unquote anime otaku. And without revealing too much, things get pretty absurd. That's where the anime gets a lot of fun, but it's also sort of its weakest area as well. Yes, all the meta humor that starts to occur is fun, but from a story perspective it's all a little confusing. Again without revealing much because I think the anime is worth going in blind, it doesn't do a great job explaining how or why the eventual baddie is doing what they're doing. Anime Gatris is a fun anime, a silly anime, it's clearly made for and by anime fans, but the story outside Minoa of making friends and joining the anime club is kind of hard to follow. But definitely check it out if you in general are a fan of anime. Up next, an anime based on a novel by Nisho Ishin, who also wrote the Monogatari series of novels, Juni Tyson, Zodiac War. Every 12 years, mercenaries who possess the highest caliber of brute strength, cunning wit, and deadly precision gather to participate in the Zodiac Tournament. Each warrior bears the name and attributes of one of the 12 animals of the Chinese Zodiac. With their pride and lives on the line, they engage in vicious combat until only the victor remains. The 12th Zodiac Tournament begins in a desolate city, devoid of any evidence of the half million people who recently lived there. To raise the stakes, each warrior ingested a poisonous gem, thus setting a time limit on the tournament. With one wish for the victor up for grabs, the Zodiac Warriors start their cutthroat battle for survival. I'll start by saying while I overall enjoyed the anime as a whole, my feelings on it are rather mixed. We'll start with probably its biggest problem. Juni Tyson has a very specific formula that each episode follows for the most part. I won't mention specifics because doing so would actually spoil a decent amount of the anime. There are a few episodes that aren't as formulaic, but by that time the average viewer may be already able to predict how the story as a whole is going to go. Now the credence to that is Juni Tyson is actually a prequel to a one-shot manga story that was released before the novel in Japan, so the readers of the manga would have already known the outcome of the Zodiac War here in the anime and novel. I don't think it's enough to excuse the mundane formula that is even more present in the novel than the anime, but I think it's something to keep in mind while watching Juni Tyson. That said, I won't forgive it for its drop in animation quality during the middle of the series. It all starts off looking pretty good falls pretty far by the middle of the season before bringing it back a bit by the end. As someone who read the novel before most of the anime finished airing, I enjoyed all the extra backstories the anime gave the characters that weren't covered in the book, though I admit some of those backstories really felt like they messed the pacing up in spots, especially when dealing with the Tatsumi brothers. Their backstory went on way too long and didn't add much character development to the characters. Regarding actual character development among the characters, Tora probably easily gets the most but it takes a while for her to show up, and even longer before the anime starts going into her character. Like I already said, I overall enjoyed Juni Tyson. I like what it added to the characters from the novel, and the animation at times was pretty good. However, at the end of the day, some of the stuff it added about the characters messed with the pacing of the anime, on top of it being very formulaic and, dare I say, fairly predictable. And while the animation looked good at times, it at other times was kind of rough. It's definitely not a bad anime. I can see where people would say it's an underwhelming anime, but I still think it's interesting in spots. I would recommend it if you're bored and wanted to watch something with a little murder death killing it. Up next, the last of the anime I originally previewed back in the fall 2017 preview, Girls Last Tour. Civilization is dead, but Chito and Yuri are still alive. So they hop aboard their beloved Cretan Cad motorbike and aimlessly wander the ruins of the world they once knew. Day after hopeless day, they look for the next meal and fuel for their ride. But as long as the two are together, even an existence as bleak as theirs has a ray or two of sunshine in it. Whether they're sucking down their fill of soup or hunting for machine parts to tinker with, for two girls in a world full of nothing, the experiences and feelings the two share give them something to live for. When I first previewed Girls Last Tour, I was interested in the scenery shown in the promotional video because it reminded me of Blam, and after the anime started, the background, scenery, just the setting in general was one of my favorite things about the anime. Not only do I think the scenery was beautiful, even though it's mostly rubble, but it also heavily tied to the story and the world Chichan and Yu find themselves in. Speaking of the world, the world building is also done really well here. It's very subtle starting off, but as the anime progresses, more and more is revealed, and by the end, you know quite a lot about what happened. 
Maybe not everything to why the world is the way it is, but it definitely gives you a good idea. On the more technical side of the anime, Girl's Last Story is still pretty good. Good animation, some great facial expressions. The character designs for Chichan and Yu are a little too cute and moe for my liking, especially when compared to some of the other characters when they show up, but that's more of a personal preference than anything being wrong. The only major negative I can think of is not that it tends to be a skosh episodic, but that because it's episodic, there are episodes that stand out being better than others. The episode where Chichan and Yu take a bath is nowhere near as good as the episode where they make music with the rain. It's not like any episode is bad, it's just there are really good episodes that make the other ones not stand out as much or be as meaningful. With that, I'd say Girls Last Door is definitely worth checking out. Especially if you're looking for an anime that's set in the post-apocalypse that isn't too action-y. Also, if you like watching cute girls doing cute things. This anime also works for that. Keeping the cute girls theme going, and the meme of the season, Blend S. High school girl Maika Sakuranomiya has trouble finding a part-time job because of how scary she looks when smiling. However, she is scouted one day by an Italian man who is also the manager of Stile, a cafe where its waitresses are given unique traits such as Sundare and Young Sister. Maika is given a sadistic trait because of her looks and has to adopt a dominant and cruel persona when serving customers particularly masochist ones. Where Blenda shines is in its characters. Over the course of the season, it shows the co-workers at Caf Stile becoming a close-knit group of friends, and it was simply enjoyable to see what type of antics each character would get up to. Maika being required to play a sadist, Miyu seeking inspiration for her doujin, Kaho being just all-around best girl. Sorry, again, I paused thinking Signum would say something. Where was I? Oh. And then there's Dino, aka the manager who has a not-so-subtle crush on Mika, And that's where I think this anime may lose some people. Not only is Dino her boss, but Mika is 16 and the manager is 26. Bit of an age gap. But they say love is blind, so I won't judge. Also, the way the anime handles it, it never comes off as creepy, but usually comedic. Though they say comedic is subjective. Okay, so here's why I think it gets a pass and doesn't turn out to be all that creepy. One reason is all the other characters besides Micah and Dino acknowledge that Dino's obsession with Micah is weird and results in them comedically saying they're going to call the cops. So it shows that the anime is aware and acknowledges the potential issue with their relationship. But the biggest thing I think that makes it work and not come off as creepy is Micah seems to have all or most of the control in the relationship. I think the anime does a good job at showcasing that she has most of the power in their relationship and I think because the viewer or audience doesn't have to worry too much about Micah's position in the relationship, it gives more time for the other characters to shine like Kaho and Akizuki. Those two are subtly the best couple in the show. Anyway, Blend Us was a lot of fun. I hope we get more of it someday, and I recommend it if you like slice of life comedies. If I had to compare it to any other anime, it's like a sillier, less serious working. Up next, what somehow ended up being my favorite anime from the fall 2017 season, a sister's all you need. Actually, I'm kind of glad Signum isn't here, otherwise they'd probably be giving me grief for liking this anime so much. Especially because of how much I hated on Aramanga Sensei when I last covered it. Anyway, here's the synopsis for A Sister's All You Need. Everyday life is full of fun, but something is missing. My life would be amazing if only I had a little sister. Why don't I have a little sister? These are the musings of a little sister lover and novelist Itsuki Hashima who only writes works featuring little sisters. Around him gather a number of unique people. Genius author pervert Nayuta, BMO college student Miyako, and fellow author friend Haruto. Each of them hold their own worries, but live their peaceful daily lives while writing novels, playing games, drinking alcohol, and filing their tax returns. The first two or so minutes of this anime are really tough. It is smutty cis kung garbage that almost had me regretting pressing the play button. But as soon as you get past those two minutes that showcase the type of light novels Itsuki writes, then you're primed for a real treat. Amongst all the hijinks and pervy shenanigans that are sprinkled throughout this anime, there's a comfy, down-to-earth, almost solemn feeling while watching. It's a mix of friends hanging out and being friends, with a little romance, mixed with the harsh reality of being a working adult and struggling to get by. Now, A Sister's All You Need obviously has its fair share of fan service. Assuming someone got by the first two minutes, there's a chance if you're not really okay with fan service, you might drop this anime. I personally didn't find it too offensive. The biggest thing is Nayu has to write naked, otherwise she can't write and occasionally needs a little inspiration from Miyako. But here's the kicker. 
they're both over 18. It was kinda nice having adult characters not in high school depicted for once. Whether it was for fan service or just following them in their day to day. I'll say it again. A Sisters All You Need was my favorite anime this season, and it was going up against the likes of Food Wars, Fate Apocrypha, and Land of the Lustrous. Which I'll go ahead and say I won't be covering any of them in this review, but as much as I enjoyed them, I put A Sisters All You Need a tick above them. I simply like the hell out of this anime. I'd say check it out if you're in the mood for a good time, but also want to skirt outside your comfort zone a little. Moving on to what I think was one of the best anime this season, Inuyashiki, Last Hero. Ichiro Inuyashiki is down on his luck. While only 58 years old, his geriatric looks often have him written off as a pathetic old man by the world around him, and he's constantly ignored and disrespected by his family, despite all he's done to support them. On top of everything else, his doctors have revealed that he has cancer, and it appears that he has little time left in this world. But just when it seems things couldn't get any worse, a blinding light in the sky strikes the earth where Ichiro stands. He later wakes up to find himself unscathed, but he soon starts to notice that there's something different about himself. However, it turns out these strange new changes are just what Ichiro needs to take a new lease on life, and now it seems like there's nothing to stop him from being a hero worthy of the respect that he never had before. Unless, that is, there was someone else out there with these same changes. And that someone else, Hiro Shishigami, turns this anime from being kind of interesting to absolutely fascinating. Inuyashiki does a pretty good job balancing the story between Ichiro and Hiro, showing them both to be fairly sympathetic even despite the atrocity Hero commits. It's amazing watching a character who reads Shonen Jump and loves One Piece and clearly has been shown multiple stories about good guys being the heroes, that he would be the one to become the villain. It's not even a slow descent either, he almost immediately starts causing havoc with his powers. It was kind of interesting just seeing how many ways he could kill someone with his powers. And just the way Hero is depicted when he's committing these heinous acts, it's unsettling to say the least. I don't have any major issues with Inuyashiki, I did feel the final episode was a little too quickly paced. I would have liked it to build up to the climax a little more. I'll avoid mentioning anything specific to avoid spoilers, but I wish the climax in the final episode was a bit better foreshadowed. It's not that it isn't foreshadowed, I just feel it could have been a little more pronounced and not just slightly in the background. Again, I'm not mentioning specifics to avoid spoilers. There's a lot of good action and even some good somber moments. Once again, I don't want to allude to them too much to avoid spoilers, but I'll admit I shed a tear or two a couple of times while watching this anime. So I definitely recommend Inuyashiki Last Hero. Maybe a little pacing problem towards the end, but otherwise just a fascinating anime to watch. And finally to what seemed to be one of the most popular anime, and definitely one of the most standout anime from the season, Recovery of an MMO Junkie. But only because of one or two things. I'll get to those in a second. Moriko Morioka is a 30 year old single neat woman. I told you I'd get to them in a second but more on them later. After dropping out from reality, she has taken off in search of a fulfilling life and ended up in a net game or Natoge. In the Natoge world, she began her new life as a refreshing and handsome character named Hayashi. While starting out as a beginner, a pretty character named Lily reached out to help her. Meanwhile, in the real world, awaits a shocking encounter with a good-looking elite company employee, a mysterious blue-eyed blonde named Yuta Sakurai. Up front, what makes MMO Junkie so fun and refreshing to watch is the main character of Morioka. It's simply nice to get an anime, whether it's a romance or not, not just from the perspective of a woman, but a woman who has crossed over into her 30s. So for once, we're not strictly dealing with naive teenagers in love, but mostly sensible adults. Like I said, mostly. Now to be honest, besides the refreshing perspective with Morioka, I wouldn't say the anime does anything new. It slowly builds into a decent romance between Morioka and Sakurai through their online meetings in a video game. I'm okay with spoiling that because it's all pretty much laid out, straightforward, fairly quickly on who Lily is in the real world. There's not really any plot twists here, maybe a few cliffhangers here and there, but surprising this anime is not. And I'm okay with that. Not every anime, specifically romance anime, needs to have all the levels of twists and misunderstandings of say something like gamers had. That said, I do wish some of the side characters were better fleshed out here in MMO Junkie. Koiwai is probably the best established side character besides Kanbei, the guild leader in the game Morioka and Sakurai play, but all the other guildmates are kind of forgettable unfortunately. Seriously, I don't even remember their names and there's only like six of them, let alone trying to remember what their relationships are to the other players in the guild. To summarize, Recovery of an MMO Junkie is a decent romance that focuses on adults, and has a fresh perspective with Morioka. 
doesn't exactly break any molds and the side characters are mostly forgettable, but it was still a very enjoyable anime, and I recommend checking it out. Especially if you want to get away from all the teenage protagonists that tend to dominate anime. And that will wrap up the Fall 2017 Anime Review. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I didn't cover every anime that aired, but I tried to cover a good amount. I didn't cover the anime I mentioned earlier, Food Wars, Beta Apocrypha, or Land of the Lustrious, because I kind of want to give them their own video if I do cover them later. However, there are some anime I didn't cover because they're still airing. Two I've really been enjoying is the second season of March Comes In Like a Lion, as well as The Ancient Mage's Bride. There's also Garo Vanishing Line, which has had some pretty cool action and fight scenes. I think it's a little inconsistent with its pacing, but it's quietly been a pretty decent anime thus far. But I digress. Don't forget I've got links to the Mal page for all the anime I reviewed in case you're interested in a little more information on them. And what was your favorite anime from the fall 2017 anime season? Go ahead and let me know in the comments below. I've been Anime Visor. Crap. Right. No Signum. Hopefully I can figure out what's going on before the next video. At any rate, thanks for watching, and goodbye.